Now, we need to remove the ribs. We'll need the loppers for this. Quite a satisfying crunch, for some anyway. Let's start. Always wear an apron, mask, and gloves. Goggles are a must when the job is... Oh shit, the fuses again. Where were we? After which... I'm not sure if you remember me. A few weeks ago, we talked about an article I'm working on. It's about your wife. I dropped by last Friday to speak to you, but you weren't working at the time. <laughs> I asked the security guard to pass on a note for me. I would like us to discuss the topic of- I thought I had made it painfully obvious for the last time. No! Please don't call me again and stop inquiring about my wife. Damn journalists. <sighs> they don't let me work. God damn it. I'm not in the best frame of mind to record a lecture for my students now. I'm feeling completely broken. <sighs> Where did I leave my meds this time? They definitely pay me too little for this. It won't be needed for the next few months. Wednesday. It's not my favorite day, although it's certainly better than Monday. Awful. It would be good to finally repair the coffee machine. I guess it was in another life. I guess it was in another life. Kidnapping this month. Archives. Just as lifeless as the corpses they concern. Archives. Just as lifeless as the corpses they concern. This place is starting to look like a hoarder's dream, rather than a storage room. I don't see any need to mess with the electrics. They are flaky enough as it is. Pills first, Jack. Pills.
Let's hope I'm not caught short this evening. But the word is, the lab will be open tomorrow. Jack, don't forget to hit the record button this time. Hopefully the new tripod is going to hold up. just have to get everything in frame. This should be fine. November 20th, 1991. Time, 8.43 p.m. Recording for medical students from the University of Missouri. This autopsy is conducted by Jack Handman. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the autopsy room. Today, you will have the dubious pleasure of following a full autopsy, step by step. For those of you who have already performed your first autopsy, this will refresh your basic knowledge. In turn, for those whose knowledge is only theoretical, I just... I advise not to watch this after a meal. Let's start. Always wear an apron, mask, and gloves. Goggles are a must when the job is splashy. And in case of sharp accidents, it's worth having disinfectants at hand. It's true that you won't get ptomaine poisoning straight away, but if your liver or kidney aren't doing well, you may end up with diarrhea. The cadaver is placed on its back on the autopsy table. The pathologist stands on the right of the deceased. Make sure that all the necessary tools are always at hand so that you don't have to run around looking for something like I do all the time. In the process of revealing and securing forensic evidence, it is difficult not to interfere with the original condition of the deceased. Written and photographic documentation plays a vital role throughout the entire examination process. During your research, be patient, inquisitive, but above all, attentive to detail. Many entries are visible at first glance, but sometimes they can be cover for more interesting stories. And lastly, remember that nothing teaches you self-narration like working with the dead. So get used to that fact soon. Everyone will think you're talking to yourself. Now, on to the police folder. That will contain all sorts of pertinent information as to who the deceased might be and what potentially happened to them. So, let's take a closer look, shall we? Some of my previous cases, a reminder of more prosperous times. I wasn't sure it would amount to anything, but the World Wide Web has been a blessing for speeding up my work.
The deceased's name is Tobias Chambers, locally known as Old Toby. Homeless and unemployed for at least a couple of years. The deceased was found on the outskirts of a parking lot at a gas station, where he often begged and persistently offered drivers to wash their car windows. The body was noticed by a station employee during the morning shift. Initially, he thought that someone had thrown some boots and a coat in a nearby ditch. It took him a moment to recognize the pile of clothes as the body of a man. He worked most of his life at the local port dealing with unloaded cargo. He was fired for being drunk and starting fights. His son runs a hardware store on his own. His wife left him years ago. They both had no contact with the deceased. Signs of libation were found around the body. Empty bottles, traces of an inept attempt to start a fire, and a scattered makeshift blanket. That's it. It's worth remembering the context around the scene of a death. This allows you to better interpret any traces found on the body. I shouldn't start the procedure without gloves. Now it's our turn to take some pictures for our files. If I can just remember where I left the camera... Um... It's in here somewhere. My old but trusted centrifuge. Ideal for all the fluid tests I need to perform during an autopsy. It's been a while since the eye wash in this thing was changed. It's probably a health hazard now. A considerable collection. Aha! <laughs> there you are. I knew it was here somewhere. As I mentioned at the beginning, before we begin the internal examination, we need to document the cadaver in the condition it arrived in. We begin with a full body photo. Try and stick to the top-down rule, but this is not always possible. Let's keep in mind it's all about the legibility, not the perfect frame. Voila. Now we move on to the next step, looking for traces. Take your time. Look at the corpse from different sides, from different angles, up close, and from a distance. You're looking for anything out of the ordinary. The boiler yield wound looks old. I'll take a closer look later. Some wounds of the feet and signs of frostbite, probably because the subject's shoes were too small. That's something interesting. It will be necessary to check whether this injury was severe enough to cause damage to the brain.
hardened hands, worn out by physical work, and frostbite. In a moment, we will check which of our initial observations will be worthy of further consideration. But before we get to that, I need to write down some basic data. Scalpel, scissors, syringe, magnifying glass, knife. Hmm. I guess I forgot to clean the knife. Personal information. Uh, the deceased was unclothed. Date. Okay. As you can see, I note everything down on previously prepared forms. Every pathologist must keep a detailed record of every step of the autopsy. This not only allows you to track the procedure, but also collates the results together, upon which you may back up your conclusions. So, enough of the boring prep. Let's begin by taking a closer look at the spots I photographed earlier. For this, you're going to need a magnifying glass. Hmm. Which spot first? It looks like a burn mark. No doubt painful, but it's not pertinent for this case. Here we can see frostbite on the fingertips. We can tell by the characteristic skin color. I can confirm the presence of ecchymosis on the deceased man's head. The appearance indicates the intravital nature of the wound. Add alcohol, which I can clearly smell. And this was an accident just waiting to happen. Definitely a painful mix of frostbite, abrasions, and blisters. Old Toby had been wearing shoes too small for him for a very long time. That's if he wore any at all. So far, there are a lot of superficial wounds, but only one serious injury to the head. Let's go back to our notes. First, I mark the location of the entries and make notes for each one. So... The head wound. Definitely an important clue. This is something we'll investigate first. Even though this type of wound didn't contribute to the deceased's death, we're still required to record it. We're not in frost season yet, but high humidity, wind, and the inability to warm up can also be causes of frostbite. If Toby's body was cold for a prolonged period, the frostbite could have resulted from the body's defense reaction. The safety of the internal organs is more important than fingers, nose, or ears. As you can see, we don't have much to go on. Let's write down what preliminary causes of death we can think of. Various types of accidents are a common cause of death among the homeless and the elderly. Perhaps old Toby slipped and accidentally hit his head. This is of no interest to us. Considering the conditions in which he slept, his body may have become hypothermic. The nights have been particularly nasty lately. We will check if there are any signs of freezing internally. Since the deceased clearly smelled of alcohol, I'll add alcohol poisoning to our list. We still have one thing left from the basics. Rigor mortis. Scalpel, scissors, syringe, magnifying glass, knife. Hmm. I guess I forgot to clean the knife.
Scalpel, scissors, syringe, magnifying glass, knife. Mm. I guess I forgot to clean the knife. A considerable collection. My old but trusted centrifuge. Ideal for all the fluid tests and poor soul. I get cases like this more than any other. Poor soul. I get cases like this more than any other. I wasn't sure it would amount to anything, but the World Wide Web has been a blessing for speeding up my work. It's been a while since the eyewash in this thing was changed. It's probably a health hazard now. Well, we take our deceased by the hand. Gradually we raise it. Now let it go. As you can see, the hand falls loose. What's the conclusion? Death must have occurred more than 72 hours ago. The police information appears correct. Head trauma seems the most promising, so we'll start there. For this, I need an oscillating saw. The cut is made from ear to ear. After which, we remove the skin and the top of the skull. After the basic examination, we can see that the brain's cerebral gyri in both hemispheres are symmetric. The brain looks good. Let's take a cross-section. Some pathologists prefer to examine organs without removing them. However, for me, it's much more convenient to examine them on a board, which we'll do now. Holding a long, narrow blade knife in the dominant hand, we slowly cut the cranial nerves on both sides, all the time pulling the brain towards us. So far, so good. The hematoma seems to have had no effect on the brain. I can't. I cannot. I need pills.
we can rule the fatal accident out as well. Brain is in good condition, so we have no choice but to proceed to the internal examination of the other organs. I grab a scalpel from my kit. The incision should be in the shape of a letter Y. We use a deep cut to reach all the way to the ribs and to penetrate the abdominal wall. Alright, now we peel back and separate the skin. Now, we need to remove the ribs. We'll need the loppers for this. Mm -hmm. Quite a satisfying crunch, for some anyway. After removing the cartilage tissue, we instantly notice two things. Firstly, there is no congestion of the internal organs. This means that although the deceased was hypothermic, it didn't kill him. Secondly, the deceased smoked like a chimney. So, we should take a closer look at those lungs. We can see widespread black and tough. Despite the tragic condition of the lungs, they are not the cause of death. Alice smoked too. It didn't kill her, but... <clears throat> Uh, what was I talking about? L lungs. Y yes Advanced inflammation. syringe. Now's a good time to collect some samples. Specifically, three. From the eye, the heart, and the bladder. I'm interested to see the concentration of alcohol in the body. Vitreous humor analysis is very useful in indicating long-term alcohol abuse. Five milliliters from the left ventricle should do it. Left on the bladder, we draw about 10 milliliters of fluid. 
Now we take our samples to the centrifuge. But before I do that, I need to find my notebook. My dyscalculia means that I always double check the settings. <laughs> Please excuse me while I run and fetch it. They definitely pay me too little for this. This old thing is covered in stains. I should check this out under the microscope sometime. Let's get back to the examination. We put all of the samples into the rotor. Now, we set the appropriate time and speed. Okay, let's roll. A considerable collection. again. W where were we? Oh yes, the blood alcohol concentration. Let's see what we've got here. Everything's separated as it should. Our lab is closed until tomorrow after the last, uh, incident. However, considering that Toby's favorite eau de parfum appears to be ethanol, I'm guessing the results won't surprise me at all. Let's go further. We will now focus on the cardiovascular system, specifically the heart. We remove the organ and examine it closely. We look for dark hypoxic areas, clots, or other elements that stand out as abnormal. At first glance, the heart looks fine. The pulmonary trunk and aorta seem to be in good condition. There are no pathological changes that would have contributed to Toby's death. Now, let's take a closer look at the stomach. Size is normal, healthy, pink color, and as expected, the stomach has no major external damage. We must now cut it open and inspect inside. We will do it carefully so that its contents do not spill out.
We open the stomach along the greater curvature, from the heart to the pyloric end. Oh, I already feel like there's something left inside. Okay, large amount of gas, small amounts of yellow, grayish food content, resembling some kind of meat. Either our deceased hadn't eaten in days, or the bulk of his stomach had already found a way out. Looks like I'll have to find the missing contents. Uh, there are two ways here. One is obvious, <clears throat> and the other is... It couldn't have been suffocation, could it? I'll add this to the list and move on to the deceased's neck. At first glance, the trachea looks normal. Same result as with the stomach. The external inspection doesn't tell us anything. This time, we'll cut on a tray. While cutting such a small organ as the trachea, we must make a precise incision. To be able to cut with the very tip of the blade, we must hold the scalpel as we would a pen. And after careful examination and deduction, we've got it. A clogged trachea. It's time to summarize the whole thing. Based on the report and preliminary documentation, it's safe to assume that the deceased passed out after consumption of alcohol and then fell asleep on his back. Then, the gastric contents refluxed and flooded the airways, causing death. That's why we don't forget about the recovery position at dorm parties. And now it's all clear. The death was suffocation. Now, signature. The mystery is solved. But for us, this is not the end. First, the dead body needs to be cleaned up. For this, we will need to close the body and grab the needle. First, we unroll the skin flaps. And then, we sew the deceased back up. I'm using the baseball stitch technique. This stitching method is very strong and quick to do. Beautiful. Now we say goodbye to the deceased and put them safely in the fridge ready for the next stage of their journey. God, I'm tired. <sighs> I'll drop these samples off at the lab on the way to the bar. It's been a while since the eyewash in this thing's changed. It's probably a health hazard now. I'll call Steven. 
I don't feel like trekking alone today. 